So as you heard me share with the children, over the past five or six weeks, we have been looking at the Bible, kind of asking that question, what the Bible is, what the Bible is not, how are we to come to the Bible? We've looked at some of those difficult passages that we read in the Bible, and last week, we finished out this series on the Bible by naming the Bible as a story. We come to the Bible to hear the stories of our faith. And today, as we do live into this second core value of grow, we begin diving into those stories. And we begin at the beginning. Now, you, if you saw in the newsletter, over the next few weeks, you will have the chance to kind of go through the entire story on your own. We'll hear little pieces each Sunday, but the book will be broken down each week. It's at the bottom of uh, your bulletin at one part today, but you can also find the newsletter for the whole thing where you can read larger chunks of Genesis on your own time. And by the time we end, you would have read about 90% of Genesis. There's a few chapters here and there I took out. But as you go through this book, really, Genesis can be broken down into kind of two main parts. You've got Genesis chapters 1 through 11, and then Genesis chapter 12 through 50. Beginning with chapter 12, you have God working through particular persons. Abraham and Sarah, we move into the stories of Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, and by the time we end at chapter 50, we are in Egypt, and the story of the Exodus begins. But before we get to Abraham, you've got these earlier chapters, Genesis 1 through 11, and these chapters are what we call origin stories, stories about beginnings. You've got creation. You've got the entrance of sin and evil into the world, the beginnings of families, work, envy, brokenness, even the beginnings of civilization as we close out those 11 chapters. All of this takes place in those first 11 chapters. And when these stories were being written down for the first time after this oral tradition turned into written word? Well, Israel was in a time of crisis. They had been defeated by the Babylonian Empire. They were living as exiles in Babylon. Their great temple, the house of God, lay in ruins, and Israel was occupied by a pagan empire. And it's during this crisis of faith during this time of trauma, that Israel began to write down its story. Why? Well, to remember and to pass on. And maybe even make some sense over where they found themselves and what was happening in their world. As one theologian said, they told their defining stories to remember who their God was and who they were. They wrote down stories to remember, to share and pass on what they believed about their God and about themselves. They, like us, they looked to the stories of their origins to make sense of things, to remember who they were. Now, it's pretty popular right now to do some of the genetic testing, you know, where you spit in a little tube and you send it off and it comes back and you can see all the different pieces that make you up. Um, Ancestry DNA is one that I have done. I may have shared that with you. And if you do that, you can go online and you can follow all these little leaves that point you in different directions to different people. PBS even has that show, Finding Your Roots. All of this is simply to learn stories learning the stories of who has come before, so hopefully we learn something about who we are. As one person said, we enlighten the present by recalling the past. And it was interesting, I was reading um, one of the books and it said that, you know, we know who we are, not from birth certificates and social security numbers assigned to us by the government, but from the stories told and retold to us by our community, 
I mean, in reality, we could stop right now and we really could test our storytelling ability and all of us share some of those stories about our families, the good, the bad, the questionable, but then who make up our family, who tell us about who we are. These origin stories that tell us who we are, where we come from, and what the world is like. This is what you find in Genesis 1 through 11. And it's important for us to remember, to remember that these origin stories are meant to tell us something important about who we are, about who God is, and about the world. It's important to remember that this is what we find when we open the Bible and we begin at page one. I mean, think about it. Of all the ways, all the ways Israel could have chosen to begin the story, they begin by telling the story of creation. And it isn't just that they tell the story of creation. They tell a story of creation that has some pretty important stuff about God, about us, about our world. There are things that we are supposed to hold on to as we move through the rest of the story. Because if you've read the story, it goes downhill really fast. These beginning words, they're what we to hold on to, to take what we learn about God and the created world with us as we encounter all that is to follow. And they tell a story of creation that begins with a good and loving creator who created and called that creation good. And they tell this story in the midst of a world where there were other creation stories, where there were other gods. And these other creation stories and these other gods, well, they gave a very different picture. One not so beautiful and kind. So if you are able, knowing you've probably heard this story lots and lots of times, if you are able, I invite you to simply listen anew to the story of creation. Close your eyes if it helps and let yourself picture all of the images. Listen for what this origin story tells us about who God is, about who we are, and about the world in which we live. And as we prepare to hear God's word this day, let us pray. Gracious God, your word surprises us, challenges us, at times upsets and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. May you come and find us today, wherever we are, however we are. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us see as you see. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, going through chapter 2, verse 3. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, the trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. 
And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in a dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with the seed in its fruits, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that God had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that God had done in creation. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, on top of this beautiful, poetic imagery that we find in these verses, there's some pretty powerful truths that we are to take away and, again, carry with us as we move through this great story. And we just read the first part. If you kept reading, you get an entirely different creation story, and the days happen in different order. Um, so I invite you to read that one today as well. But one, one thing to think about is just how this story begins. You get this powerful image of creator and creation. What we have is a God who is active in the world and the lives of the creatures on behalf of God's creational purpose long before Israel existed. Just this image of creator and creation long before Israel existed. A creator God in the world to meet us. And again, if you kept reading on, you'd see a God who walked in the garden that God had created a God at work at every place in the world. From page one, we find a God of engagement. And it is this engagement that is important. It's not really our knowledge of it or how it was accomplished, because think about it. We 
human beings, individuals, and communities, we receive life from the Creator apart from any knowledge of its source. We simply get the gift of life, the gift of creation. And this creation story that was told and retold, it also tells us that God's work in the world has to do with more than us. I mean, think about it. We share the sixth day of creation with animals. But we also do learn about us. One, well, we learn that we have work to do. We're given work to do. A lot of times we get this image of the Garden of Eden where we're just laying around eating bonbons and it's a paradise. But in reality, in the very beginning, we are given work to do. We carry responsibility in this great created order. We are co-creators. And two, well, we learn that we, me and you, and the next person we meet, and the next person we meet, and the next person we meet, we all carry God's image, each and every one of us. And finally, we learn, though we sin, and we learn that only a couple chapters over, that though we sin, we have to carry this beginning story and remember that though we sin, we remain a part of God's good creation. We are still in the divine image. So this week, you will have the chance to read through Genesis 1 through 11, these origin stories. And as you do read, you'll find that this book of faith, well, it moves from the morning of the universe to the ordering of families and nations to the birthing of fathers and mothers of Israel. It's a mix of a very human story and God's story. You'll find narrative after narrative, but also genealogy, after genealogy. In fact, you may not know this, but there's 10 genealogies in Genesis, and six of those take place in chapters 1 through 11, in these origin stories. And what I think is interesting is that Genesis doesn't introduce God. Have you ever thought about that? It just assumes God doesn't need to be introduced. We aren't really told about God. But God is the subject of more activity than any other character in Genesis 1 through 11. And some of that activity, we have to admit, is hard for us. Some of that activity in Genesis 1 through 11, if you choose to read it this week, you may stop and be like, oh, I don't know about that. But it's a God that creates, that blesses, that gives laws, that judges, that grieves, that saves, that elects, that promises, that makes covenants, that provides counsel, that protects, that confers responsibility to human beings, and that holds them accountable. All in the first 11 chapters. These 11 chapters give us a picture of God's core character and way of relating to the world. Again, a God who was active in the world. Next week, we'll get to Abraham. And as we get to Abraham, we are asked to remember this, that Abraham and Israel, well, they're called into a world where God is already deeply engaged. This is a relational God, a God present and active in the world, a God who enters into a relationship of integrity with the world. And God does so in such a way that both the world and God are affected by that interaction. But it's not a God that is aloof. No, it is a God that has decided to get caught up with the creatures moving toward the divine purpose for the whole world. And really, the rest of the Old Testament is a witness to this God. But back to Genesis 1, this picture, this imagery, this poem that we read this morning. I want to share with you um, something I came across in one of the books I was reading, and it, it kind of was an interpretation. Um, either I haven't heard before, or I didn't know I heard, or wasn't really listening when I heard it, um, but it was really interesting to me. So in seminary, when you talk about the creation, we begin by naming that God created ex nihilo, 
out of nothing. You may have talked about this in some of your small groups or your Sunday schools. God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. Christians have been taught this since the fifth century. It's kind of like there was nothing and then bam, there was something. But this, this theologian that I was reading said, well, really, that was a very Roman idea. It connotes a God with absolute power and authority, which the Romans would have liked. But for the Hebrew world, it wasn't out of nothing. Something was there, he says. A formless void, an empty place, the deep darkness. Now, before we get bogged down on, oh, I wonder which interpretation is correct, I don't really think that's the point. I think it's more interesting to think about how this person spoke about it, something we talked about in this Bible series, all the different voices that come to the Bible. And this is what spoke to me. He was citing Catherine Keller's work, Face of the Deep, and the author says that bara, which I'm probably saying wrong, the Hebrew word for creating doesn't mean ex nihilo, making something out of nothing, but instead, bara suggests taking raw materials and shaping them into a new object that has purpose, that has use, that has a beauty. The universe, he says, before God touches it, is not empty like a blank space, but more like a lifeless desert. And a desert isn't nothing, right? It is just, at times, a dry waste without life and form. So God takes all of that emptiness and makes it fruitful, filling it with life and light and green and growing things. So think about these first 11 chapters, origin stories, stories that tell us who we are, where we come from, what the world is like, or in this case, who God is, who we are. And what our story says from page one is that this story, well, this is a story of hope. No matter how formless and desert-like life may seem, it might yet flower again. What can our God do? Well, the God experienced by a people who chose to write down their story of faith during a traumatic event, during a crisis of faith, what they're saying is our God can enter into the mess, our brokenness, our formless voids, and God can shape them and us into something purposeful, something beautiful, something useful. I think that's part of what we are to remember today as we begin this journey into our story, is this exa is exactly what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. Our God remains. I loved this line in one of the works that said, in the Holy Bible that I read and love, the story of the universe begins with a desert place bursting into sudden life and potential. And the story of humanity begins with life breathed into something that a moment before was only dust. Humanity begins with life breathed into something that a moment before was only dust. You see, part of what we are to do is simply to pause and to stand in wonder and amazement at the jewel of the world God has created as we do move through all the other messy, broken places. To remember that our God created something beautiful out of dust. I have a quick little video that I hope you carry with you as a way to challenge yourself to live into that um, this week. Well, I say I do. My favorite poet is Mary Oliver, and I'm totally going to get it like a thousand percent wrong, but she has a poem called 
uh, when death comes. And it says something about when death comes, I want to be able to say that all my life I lived married to the bride, married to the bridegroom of amazement. That that all my life, essentially, I saw how good it was. I I, um, I was soaking it up. I didn't miss it. And I think that's that's kind of the deal. God made an extraordinarily beautiful world. I mean natural beauty and the beauty of people and, and art and music and food and flavors and even what, what human hands have created and cities and architecture and, and, and children and the world is an extraordinary place and most of us miss most of it because of all this other stuff we have going on. Um, the things we're trying to be and do or the things we're trying to battle against and break down. There's an extraordinary thing going on. It's like the most beautiful concert you've ever heard and you decide to take a call in the middle of it and miss the entire thing. And so I think I want to know that I spend my, spent my life married to the bridegroom of amazement. I, I, think, I think being amazed is a really good way to live. Remembering that we believe in a God who created and called that creation good. I just want to share with you another story we find within our book of faith um, from the Psalms. Praise the Blessed One. Give praise from the heavens and from all ends of the earth. Give praise all you angels, angels of earth and of heaven. Give praise sun and moon. Give praise all you shining stars. Give praise, all universes, the whole cosmos of creation. Praise the Blessed One, for through love all was created and firmly fixed forever and ever. Yes, the pattern of creation was established. Give praise to the beloved, all the earth, all that swim in the deep and all the winged ones in the air. Give praise, all mountains and hills, all trees and all minerals. Give praise, all four-legged and all that creep upon the ground. Leaders of the nations and all peoples, young and old, give praise. Unite together in all your diversity, that peace and harmony might flourish on earth. Let all people praise the Beloved, who is exalted in heaven and on earth, whose glory is above heaven and earth. For all are called to be friends, companions to the true friend, giving their lives joyfully as co-creators and people of peace. Praises be to the Blessed One, the very breath of our breath, the very heart of our heart. Amen.